All right, everyone. Hi, my name is Alon Gorin. Um, I'm one of the founders of Draper Gorin Home. I've got Joseph and Tim with me as well, and Dara will be interviewing us soon. But uh, like I said, I'll do a quick overview. Um, something I like to start with, and we've, we've struggled with this because we're constantly <laughs> telling entrepreneurs to tell us who you are, not who you're not. So, uh, but I want to just clarify things because when I talk to investors, this is the first uh, misunderstanding there might be. We're not active crypto traders, at least Draper Gorin Holm as a group, our venture studio is not uh, active crypto traders in, you know, uh, in the way that you meet a lot of crypto hedge funds. But we are obsessed with the technology. We love Bitcoin and we invest in early stage companies. We're very focused on, on early stage blockchain companies and we're very long on the space and on those types of companies. So it's an early stage venture model uh, in, in blockchain and crypto. Very simple model. We have a couple of the biggest events in the space and a huge platform and we get access to people before anyone else. So when we find companies that we love, we, we amplify everything they do at an early stage and we work with them. Uh, every once in a while, we find an opportunity, we decide to incubate internally or with some of the best entrepreneurs in the space, and we, we grow those companies as well. And then through our fund, we double down on the companies who are growing and doing exceptional, uh, exceptionally well. It's very much the, the very common, you know, build a large portfolio and exercise optionality on the companies who are doing well. Every once in a while, we might miss a company at the very earliest stage, or we know the founders are entrepreneurs or successful people in the past and they didn't have a seed round or an early stage round and our fund will double down on those folks as well. Um, we have a very simple strategy. Like I said, we, we work with the, those companies at the early stage of, of the venture uh, and then our fund doubles down on the rest is just another way of visualizing what I just said. Um, we've had great early traction, our events. We have 14 portfolio companies now in the venture studio and we've seen a little over a five and a half uh, times multiple already on our venture studio. So it's going very well. Um, our events, this just showcased a little bit with that tens of thousands of attendees now, 150,000 people on our email list and we get great distribution through our media partners, through marketing agencies we work with, through uh, our, our automated marketing. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna try to go through this fast and, and we can talk about the, the details later, but we've had ex exceptional partners because of all of the work we've done in the space. And a lot of them have become portfolio companies, partners for our portfolio companies. Some of them even have become LPs or investors in us. Um, the media part is, is exciting for us because even though we get all the crypto media, and I think I mentioned that we had about 65 media partners, we get the mainstream media par to participate as well. It's really important for the crypto space as a whole. Um, but like, as you can see in this picture, one of our CEOs of our portfolio companies is on our expo floor talking to CNN at one of our events. It's, it's both, that's the type of exposure we try to help get uh, our, our portfolio companies. We're very, very hands-on. Um, and up until very recently, it was only Joseph and I as full-time staff. Um, and we were able to demonstrate the, the sort of level of, of, of larger groups because of the automated sort of marketing and, and way that we run, we run the group. All of these logos are people we talk with on a regular basis, have spoken at our conferences, or we've co-invested in deals on. Um, part of what makes us able to scale so large is our network. So we've got incredible venture partners. Um, a couple of these we haven't even publicly announced yet because we're staggering the, the, the publicity, but Joy Schoffler is one of the world's experts in fintech communications. Shruti was the head of Amazon blockchain until recently. Rodney is, is a huge community leader and the leader of Opportunity Hub. He introduces us to a ton of early stage blockchain companies. And David Blesnack is a, a bit of a weird one because he's one of our portfolio company CEOs, but he's one of the world's experts in DeFi. And he introduces us to tons of incredible portfolio companies. We're a part of the Draper Venture Network, as, as you might imagine, but we were a part of it before Tim uh, joined us and invested in us. Um, and it's been incredibly valuable. We get to introduce our companies to funds around the world. 
it's really, really valuable. One of them right now is writing a check to, uh, to one of our companies, the one we were discussing before the call. Uh, um, and, uh, and not just us, you know, distributing our portfolio companies, these guys, not all, they're traditional VC funds, not all of them are experts in blockchain or, or anything like that. And they meet a ton of blockchain companies and they'll show them to us first at, for our expertise, for our opinion, to do a reference check. So it's a great, incredible source of deals as well. And not just for us, for our portfolio companies, they have a full-time staff of people who introduce them to corporate partners who help scale globally. There's a private member portal where our companies can go and get find discounts at some of the corporate members, but also get connected to other investors outside of the network and things like that. They have a full-time staff basically helping our portfolio. This is invaluable for a small group like us. Um, and basically that's it, right? Our unfair advantage is that we get incredible deal flow. We get to spend a lot of time with the teams through of all of our events and things like that, pick the ones we want to invest in, and then through our network, create opportunities and, uh, and you know, for, for investments, partnerships, and, and scale. Uh, here's our portfolio companies. There's a cool, the box at the top just shows, you know, the companies that we've incubated. The rest are companies we've invested in and participated in and helped grow. And uh, some of them, we just did the deals. These are very small. Some of them are growing really, really well. It's, it's exciting. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to connect with you after this and go through this in a more proper fashion than just the quick five minute recap. But uh, it was important for me to go through this. My email address is a at Draper Gorin Holm. You go to our website, check it out, and happy to connect, connect with all of you after this. Um, let's get to it. Let's have a conversation. This is, this is why we're here and what we're excited about. Um, we asked Dara if she'd like to, to come on board, and she came, and she's been uh, incredible and great. Um, and uh, Dara, we've known for a while. She was doing uh, FinTech TV. She, she's been in the space for a while, but she's from a traditional finance background, so understands the traditional side, but also has always been on the cutting edge. We've known her since our crowdfunding days. So thank you, Dara. I'll, I'll bring it to you and you can lead the conversation now. Yeah, no, no, thank you so much. It's really an honor, happy to be here and, and really just sitting down talking to you guys. And that presentation was fantastic. And it's so amazing to see, you know, just how much has been accomplished just in such a short time. So maybe we'll just start because you know you mentioned a little bit um, uh, of the background. Maybe we'll start you, with you, Tim, because um, I'd love to learn a little bit more of how this all came together, how you guys all came together. Um, you know, you, the, the, you talked about the firm recently rebranding um, and putting the name Draper Gorin Home. Uh, so, what, Tim, for you, what made you invest and come on board? What attracted you to this? Oh. Well, we first met, um, well, actually many years ago, we met because uh, I backed Alon uh, in, a, in a crowdfunding. Uh, he, he was creating crowdfunding for other people. And it was a great concept and the uh, company didn't quite turn out the way we'd hoped, but he, um, he kept in touch and, and then he, entered, he uh, brought me to one of his conferences uh, and it was a spectacular conference. It was a fantastic group of people. Uh, the media was uh, was there in a big way. The um, the conference went very well. I came back to another conference where I said, "Okay, I'll do a book signing." I ended up staying for five hours. I I signed eight hundred books. Wow. Um, and then uh, and then I realized that this was a a community that really was looking for something. It was a, it, it's a tight group and it's a community that's saying, hey, the existing system isn't working for us. The, 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 the bank with the government and how, how fiat currency gets distributed and moved and whatever, it's not working for us. And that was even before the US government just planted nine trillion dollars on on us and and diluted the dollar by about 20 percent um before the i mean because it we it was always like a theoretical thing about like oh yeah those guys in argentina have bad currency or or in nigeria bad currency they weren't thinking hey that the dollar was could be subject to political whims but they were still a very strong 
great community that these guys had really encouraged and developed around uh, Bitcoin, the blockchain, smart contracts, uh, this new way of thinking, the new way of operating, this, these new currencies that were decentralized and open and transparent, tied to the blockchain. Uh, you know, this is, this is like magic. You don't have to pay two and a half to four percent when you swipe your credit card. The banks don't take money from you every time you, you make a purchase. Uh, this, is, this is a new way of operating. And, and as more and more people get more and more enthusiastic about it, their friends get on board and, and, it's, a, and it's a growing thing. Well, well, these guys had created that community down in LA and had um, and that community started to grow and become a global community. And I got very excited about it. And I said, you know, and they, they wanted to build this, uh, this uh, accelerator for, for blockchain, Bitcoin, uh, smart contract companies. And I, I said, yeah, this is a great thing. We'd love to have you first in the network. And then I, I said, yeah, I want to invest. I think this is going to be something really extraordinary. Uh, and I think we have, uh, we work together very well and, uh, and have had uh, a lot of fun working together. And so I think it's going to be uh, uh, the beginning of something extraordinary. I, and, I agree. And even and I, I've inside been... the network, you know, inside the, the Draper Venture Network, we have a lot of expertise in crypto. We have a lot of expertise in smart contracts. We have a lot of expertise in the blockchain and Bitcoin. Uh, but it's nice to have a group that's completely dedicated to it. And I think that that is a, that is a real asset we have. And, uh, and now, uh, yeah, I think this is going to be a great thing. So it's, exci it's exciting time. I, I'm and, you know, privileged to be a part of it. Yeah, and watching you guys grow from the beginning, but also you really are on the forefront. And we're going to talk about in you know in this conversation some of those changes that are happening in the space because it feels like, the, you know, it feels like the industry is moving you know second by second. You know, you can't even keep track of everything that's happening. So maybe also for for you for you Joseph, um, how have the the co-founders, the venture partners, and everyone worked together? It seems like you guys have a really great camaraderie. How do you you know how do you see the whole the, the whole group? Yeah, I mean you know just like uh, Tim and Alon, we've all known each other for a really long time, and and uh, you know Alon and I met at South by Southwest on a panel where we spoke about crowdfunding in in 2014, uh, and and that that panel in hindsight ended up being really historic in the way uh, that uh, two of our venture partners, Joy Schoeffler and Rodney Sampson also spoke on that panel. So, you know, we've all like, uh, we've grown since then, we've, we've moved on to do new things. We obviously, you know, get into blockchain and Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies, but we, you know, there is a lot of trust. Uh, we like each other really well. And, and that's, that's why uh, it's, it's a, such a privilege to work with these guys uh, and this built a great foundation that we're now, you know, raising this fund on. That's great. All right, so let's take, let's really jump in now to kind of the meat and potatoes and really get into the kind of into the weeds and you know what's happening in this blockchain space. Um, so maybe Tim, I'll start with you. You know, why invest in blockchain startups? I mean, what what's the big opportunity here? Is this like 1990, you know, is this like 1993? And this is, you know, the internet emerging? Is it bigger than that? How do you see it? Yeah, it's like 1980. It's like 1890 oh, when okay. they created the banking system. Right. Um, this is one of the biggest things. I mean, okay. The internet was interesting. It, com it transformed industries like communications, information, gaming, entertainment, uh, media, whatever. Lots of interesting industry. Eventually uh, transformed taxis and hotels. But these technologies, uh, Bitcoin, the blockchain, smart contracts, are, are going to transform the the way we operate, the, the way the financial world operates, the way uh, governments operate, the way uh, people communicate and do business with each other. Uh, first of all, they're global. Uh, 
the world went global with the internet and um, some governments are trying to put the genie back in the bottle, you know, like the Chinese government is trying to go, no, 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 we're tribal, we're a tribe. And they, they the people of China realize that this makes no sense and we want an open system and the world works better that way. So it's global and it, it allows um, people to be in Syria and if they have a bad government in Syria, they get sent to Greece as a refugee, they can take their money with them. They don't have to have a bunch of Syrian, I don't know what they are, type of dollars that, and that nobody's gonna take in uh, Greece. So, so people can move this money very easily, very flexibly all around the world. Um, it's, it's decentralized in that um, you, you don't have a, a, any government saying, here's how many we're gonna print. And it, it's all driven by politics. It's driven by the whims of some leader or whatever. Uh, this is decentralized they, um, and Bitcoin doesn't change. That will be 21 million and that's it. Um, and, and some like Tezos have um, the owners of the currency are the ones who vote the currency and decide whether they're gonna print more or whatever they're gonna do. Uh, so, so these currencies are, are okay, so they're, they're global and they're uh, open and, they, um, and they're decentralized. So there's no one group or person who can determine how much gets printed. And, uh, and then they're, they keep a perfect record. Uh, they keep a perfect record on the blockchain. And what that means is that um, we, you don't need to spend countless dollars on accounting, bookkeeping, auditing, whatever, because you're, you've got a perfect record right there. So, uh, you know, there are software companies that are being built around that. Like, hey, let's get some accounting systems built in to the blockchain. Um, and, then, and then they are, um, th these smart contracts mean that you're gonna be able to put your contract up in the cloud. So every deal you do is gonna be built into software. So you don't have to have big, long legal documents. Uh, you can have a simple smart contract that just shows this is how the waterfall works. This is where the money goes. This is uh, how, I mean, I have a vision that we'd be able to raise a fund that's all in Bitcoin. We invest in the companies all in Bitcoin. They pay their employees and suppliers all in Bitcoin. And the whole, first of all, all the accounting's done. And all the, um, and then the contracts are all done so that um, the waterfall, if a company is sold or or something good happens or there's distribution, the the money flows into everybody's Bitcoin wallet. Uh, this is a natural, and it would we we spend venture capitalists spend a lot of money on these support services, the accountants, the lawyers, the right. auditors, the transfer agents, the whole thing. Um, that system is about to be completely automated. And that's when amazing. that's completely automated, and, and I think what has to happen is um, tax, government tax people have to get on board. They have, to, they have to understand that it's just as good to take Bitcoin in taxes as it is to take dollars in taxes better <laughs> and we're starting um, to see that right we're, we're seeing that a little bit and, here and there with, and, with and new so legislation if, right so if you build a, a you can either just mimic the existing tax system and just say you can do your work and if you do your work in dollars you pay in dollars you do your work in bitcoin you you pay in bitcoin it, it's a pretty simple transformation uh, nobody has to learn anything new um, there are other things that could happen for taxation that are really cool because Bitcoin is so uh, flexible and frictionless. Uh, you could actually figure out how to tax transaction. But governments have to see it and feel it and get on board and not think, no, no, we're a tribe. We have to do it the same way we've all, always done it before. So, uh, yeah, so this is a new way of operating and people are it's 
that small group that we started with that seemed very, you know, very encouraging and, and dedicated and, and enthusiastic about this new world has continued to grow and grow and grow and grow. Uh, and they've overcome all sorts of things where China said Bitcoin's illegal and then all of a sudden Japan says Bitcoin's a national currency. And then uh, finance gets kicked out of China. They have to go to Singapore and Singapore then gets heavy handed. They go to Malta and Malta goes, come on in. Right. Um, all of these things are starting to happen where, where we're, we're growing. It keeps being bigger. And this COVID thing has made it so people have increased their usage of Bitcoin wallets to the point where Goldman Sachs is starting to panic and they're saying, wait, wait, you guys are all taking money out of my bank? You're, you're taking your money out of my bank? And they're, they're going, no, Bitcoin's not an asset. We don't want that. Um, it's, it's, they're, they're panicking and they're saying, uh, and they're and they're doing what they can to stick in this old tribal world, when the rest of us are in this new global, transparent, open, frictionless world. And uh, and I know because I've taken money and moved it recently. Taken money and moved it into Bitcoin. Uh, taken money from uh, the bank and moved it into Bitcoin. And my banker said, "This is going to Bitcoin." Right. <laughs> like, like I love it. More money is leaving our bank. And so there is a, you know, and then you hear from Warren Buffett and he goes, oh, this is, you can just play around with it. Of course, because he has most of the dollars. You know? right. He has a bunch of dollars. And he's watching them dive as governments are printing them like crazy. And, and he's thinking, oh, God, I like the way it works now. I don't want I don't want this global world. Keep it the old way. So we're seeing, and then if you ask somebody who's 35 years old, would you rather have $10,000 or a Bitcoin? They will all take Bitcoin. Anybody right. younger than 35. Older than 35, most of them will still take the dollar. But they're, they're dying off. <laughs> this new group is coming, coming forward. It's and that's going to be the way the world economy works. And we know it. And governments are going to have to um, compete for us. They're going to have to adapt to this new world. Sorry. I and, and they're starting to a little bit here and there with some of the new legislation. And also, you know, you, you mentioned COVID. No one even wants to touch dollar bills or coins anymore. <laughs> you know? we, we've got a portfolio company doing some interesting things around that, actually. Uh, uh, doing a bit of a uh, crisis uh, uh, help. They're basically helping people in this time of need by making uh, a gift card type of system where you don't actually have to touch and hold the gift cards either. Because right. before this, uh, groups were even trying to abolish gift cards because of the waste of plastic, which, which is just funny. They'll, they'll abolish it because of the waste of plastic, not because it's just archaic and old and, and kind of silly to have a card when you can have it on your phone or whatever. But one of our uh, companies has a blockchain solution for for that world and they're gonna try to, you know, you don't need paper money anymore. If not even if you're in the traditional world, you can use your phone and all that and touchless stuff, but but with cards as well. It's, it's really interesting. I, I wanna know that about that because I was actually looking at that for a gift for a, for a family member. That's a great, that's a great thing. And actually that's a great segue on into kind of talking about and moving a little bit away from the uh, cryptocurrency aspect of it, you know, to, because we all see how that has just exploded, but also a little bit more to, you know, what's going on behind the scenes with some of these, with some of these companies? Why early stage blockchain companies? Mm. What is some of the innovation that's happening there? Yeah, I mean, so we're, we're like Tim is talking about, we're obsessed with, with Bitcoin and blockchain and this borderless world, right? Like I, I can, uh, I, I can remember I was joking about being a punk rocker. I grew up screaming, no borders, no nations. Like that, that was one of our things we would yell. But, but companies are building these products that are making the world borderless. Uh, whether you, you know, uh, uh, believe in, in some of these things or not, they are creating technology to streamline working with regulations, doing all that stuff. Why early stage startups in particular? Um, it's, there's, there's a few reasons. One, we're, we're early stage startup guys. We can add the most value to companies in that space, both Joseph and I. 
uh, know and understand that world uh, better than any other world, and especially in fintech. And so for that reason, we've always gone to or to early stage companies. We've always worked with early stage companies and 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 we've we've done that uh, from a just VC standpoint. Why early stage companies? Um, when I was a venture partner, at one of the other Draper network funds, I learned a ton from uh, Eric Mamounis at Wavemaker about why early stage. And they had incredible data that basically showed every single stage of the venture process in investing. There's less risk when you go into D plus stage uh, investing, but as a category, the early stage model actually was the most profitable as well. So we kind of adopted a similar model to them, which is build a very large portfolio, a huge funnel of early stage companies, and then be able to exercise optionality on, on the ones that are, that are best. So or the ones that are growing and winning. And, uh, and, and it's so far working really well for us, but I mean, as a just general idea, if we're just talking about why invest in early stage, that's important. On the blockchain specific side, early stage is, is incredibly important and early stage blockchain companies are incredibly important because they're building the rails for the future of this right. stuff. You know, Tim, Tim talked about how we could automate financing, and doing things like that. Like Vertalo in our portfolio company, one of our portfolio companies is basically automating cap table management on the blockchain. And they're actually building that world where when you have a distribution to your investors, it all happens through the waterfall on the blockchain, totally transparent and verifiable. That's super exciting. That's really, really exciting. Onera is taking that and, and bringing it to the next level, right? So, so there are companies that are doing this now. And if we support them, if we believe that the future 10 years from now will just be that there's no such thing as digital securities versus regular securities, a blockchain enabled company versus another company. They're all gonna be building on these rails because the customers and consumers are demanding it. Nobody's gonna be okay with Wells Fargo running the way that they're running now in 10 years. They're just not going to be, they'll all leave. And, and so every company will be doing this. So supporting the, the underlying infrastructure, those companies is really important to us. And that's, that's it's sort really, of you're what we're passionate about, obviously. You're helping hey, lead the I, I see a sure. question from Susan Ali, uh, who, good questions. Um, hey, they're, they're high, I'm talking about high transaction costs for, for uh, credit cards, but what about Coinbase? They charge high transaction costs. Yeah, over time, those are going to shrink down. People are, uh, and they'll go down much lower because you don't have a bank to pay. Um, the other thing is if you use Ledger, um, use a Ledger, you're not paying any transaction costs. Right. Um, if you use Ethereum, you pay a little bit of gas every time you send it, but it can, you can send a lot for a little gas. Um, but if you're using Bitcoin, you don't, there's no transaction cost between Ledgers. So, um, so there, those, those numbers are going to fall much faster than the bank and uh, government driven numbers. And, and they're already, yeah. even, even the high fees in crypto are much lower than the banks, right? You send a wire transfer, they'll charge you $30 and things like that. You can send, there's no amount to the limit. Like people always share these transactions on Twitter. So if you're a nerd like us, you're living in that world, you'll see somebody be like, somebody just transferred $122 million for a 47 cent transaction fee and it's Amazing. like and we're complaining in the crypto world that transaction fees are getting out of control it's really silly so the second question is about telegram's ico and how it failed and the um the government came down on them and made it sort of disappear and it was a lot of wasted money for investors and does that mean it's the end of the ico well what it means is icos um we'll move to other locations. And what that means to governments is if you're too heavy handed on regulation, you're gonna lose technologies to other places. You know, we, it's, it's unfathomable for an American to think that technology would start anywhere else, but it's gonna move other places if we keep allowing the SEC and the, the whoever else creates all of these rules on us to to put a damper on the development of these new technologies and i know the people i know that at the sec are constantly trying to weigh this we want innovation but we want to kind of stick with these 80 year old laws and we're 
it's a real struggle. Um, well, you know, if you want to do an airdrop anywhere, it's illegal in the U.S., but you can do it anywhere else in the world. And and so people are kind of doing airdrops other places, and that means that, that those technologies get developed somewhere else and it become important for other countries. Uh, so that's where this tribalism is going global, and the the governments have to be more open to uh, to competing by by deregulating rather than kind of overregulating and feeling you know kind of like a bully going and going no everybody has to go my way we have a new uh, this is a new world and it's opening up and people have got to get on board and I you know I'll say it I'll wear my tie you know <laughs> my Bitcoin tie. I'm going to keep pushing for it because it's coming. And I want anybody who will listen to understand that this organization keeps growing. And it's, it's just bigger and bigger and bigger every day. Every time somebody gets a new Bitcoin wallet, every time somebody makes a transfer for, with Bitcoin, they're starting to realize this is a better way to operate. And, uh, and so you're going to have regulators go, no, we want it to be the old way. We want it. To, we have an 80-year-old law. It should stay that way. I'm looking at that 80-year-old law, and I'm thinking, God, this is crushing the U.S. Um, innovation. And uh, and it may be time to kind of revisit that, rethink it. Uh, but you know, they're caught up thinking about this virus that turned out to be, you know, one eighth of the flu from. 2018. So, uh, I, you know, they're 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 lost in these other things that are shinier objects to them right now. But boy, the world economy is changing, and the where where innovations happening is changing, and it's going to be uh, very much a global world. And I, I think it's time. You know, if you guys are investors, get on board. And, and, you know, truth, I mean, the only thing you could ever truly bank on is change. I mean, we're not sitting here talking on, you know, landlines where we can't see each other. You know, we, we, we're not riding into work on our horses. I mean, the whole world changes. You know, it's interesting. And, and to, the big, you, biggest beneficiary of change is, is the entrepreneur who drives the change. The second biggest exactly. beneficiary is the venture capitalist who supports the entrepreneur who drives that change. And that's why it's so great what you guys are doing. And you, you had mentioned um, uh, DeFi, and maybe Joseph, you could kind of jump in a little bit uh, for those out there who don't really understand the concept or the meaning of DeFi. Could you dive a little bit into that and talk a little bit about what you're doing in that space and some of the companies that, that you're working with in that space? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the discussion is a lot about disrupting the financial system and the banks and, and DeFi is just that. Uh, it, it, it's essentially using smart contracts and automation to remove the middleman. Uh, you know, so one of our portfolio companies, uh, DeFi Money Market or DMM, they have launched a, a real world asset backed stable coin uh, that, that earns uh, income from a, a carpool loan uh, that they put on the blockchain and that pays six and a quarter percent interest rate, right? So uh, you can take your money to Wells Fargo and get 0.05% or you can put it on a blockchain and get over 6%. And that's really exciting. And, and what's even more exciting to me is, is like Alon said, this is building the rails, right? So other entrepreneurs can come build applications on top of this that, you know, create a better user experience and that, that reach more mainstream consumers, and then they can decide whether they want to put their money to work for them or not. And, and that's part of what decentralized finance really uh, is all about and why, why it excites me so much. So it's interesting because you had Tim before talking a little bit about you know changes that need to be done in these 80 plus year old securities laws. You're talking about you know DeFi, which is a, you know, a complete transformation, decentralized. Talk a little bit about, and this is an area I'm really interested in because it's interesting to see where it goes. You kind of put those two together and um, security tokenization, asset tokenization. 
Um, where are, you know, I, I'd like to learn a little bit more, you know, we call the, the, the security token space. Um, and I know you guys just did a you know, big conference about this um, a couple of months back. Um, could you tell us more about that space in particular, why it's so exciting, where you're investing in that, in that area? Yeah, so I, I think of this, there's, there's like, it's like a step process for me because ideally, the idealistic part of me wants only Bitcoin, wants a thousand, you know, a million percent decentralized. Let, let us work peer to peer and we'll work with each other. We'll decide who we work with and if people are dishonest. We'll find a way to get rid of them. But whether or not we agree with it or not, we live in the United States. Um, there's other people that live in Malta. There's other people that live in uh, the UK. There's other people live in Australia, Israel, wherever you live, you have regulation in your jurisdiction. And so there's companies, one of, you know, one of our portfolio companies, Onera, sort of led this discussion at, at, this, uh, at this conference that we put together. And we had uh, the head of blockchain for, for Goldman Sachs and for Morgan Stanley and for every one of those large institutions we were just talking about who, who are goofing around on the Bitcoin side, but they are dying behind the scenes to actually use this technology or figure out where they're going to use this technology. And the way I see it is that if we have to play with regulation uh, and play ball with it, let's find a way to use the technology to streamline it so much so that we don't have to actually you know, so that the legal part is automated, so that the accounting part is automated. And what it's eventually doing is it's creating this digital jurisdiction and it's making it easier for people to choose where they live on the internet. And uh, there's countries like uh, through, through Tim, we met um, uh, uh, the Estonian president, I think it was, and, and he created digital citizenship in his country. People are going to start doing this, it's happening. And so creating the rails for the global uh, economy to transact with each other digitally will streamline all of the processes and make, make it easier for institutions to play ball. So something that's interesting there is that that company I mentioned earlier, Vitalo, that's bringing cap tables to the blockchain, did an integration with Onera, another one of our portfolio companies, and they instantly showed that the number one problem the institutions were having was they said, well, we'd like to play ball with each other. We'd like to take our $500 million bond and digitize it and make it easier to trade, but there just isn't products out there to do it that are compliant. And they literally showed in, 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 the, in the thing, in less than 10 minutes, they showed how they could hand the bank an issuance platform that will integrate directly with their technology and transfer assets and show the, represent, the representation of the assets on the blockchain, show the cap table, do their waterfall distributions without any middleman. They, they demonstrated this to Goldman Sachs, to Morgan Stanley, to all of these banks right there on the thing and said, no more excuses, we're doing it and we're working together. So we had the head of IBM blockchain on there and the head of R3 and all of these consortiums were on there and they basically said, we're ready to go, let's do this. And, and now we're seeing behind the scenes, we can't talk about specifics, but some of those major banks are talking to our portfolio companies about putting their assets on the blockchain. And I, I think this is a stepping stone. And I, I've said this out loud at the beginning of the thing, it's gonna be a join us or, or you know, go the way of the dinosaur, right? You're either gonna become extinct or you're gonna be a become a part of this, this, new, uh, this, this new technological revolution. So that's why I get excited about that. You know, like I, if I'm being brutally honest, I would rather everyone just let's let's just let's just go straight to DeFi and let's everyone do their own thing. But it's it's not going to happen. I have a family. I'm not going to break securities laws, right? So uh, so and I have no choice. And so let's figure out how to streamline that so that I don't have to spend a hundred thousand dollars in legal fees for my company to raise money on the internet um, and and things like that. So it's or a million dollars plus to do an IPO. Exactly. It, it's absurd. It makes no sense. And it, it, cuts, it cuts entrepreneurs off at the knees, right? That, that's not how it, it should be. We need, to, we need to foster innovation, make it easier for people to innovate, not, not slow us all down. So talk a little bit about the fund thesis. Um, oh, Joseph, maybe you could weigh in a little bit about that. What's so unique about your investment strategy? Yeah, sure. So our platform really is the is the summit that we host once a year at the LA Convention Center. So LA Blockchain Summit attracts thousands and thousands of attendees. 
uh, and, and is also a really great funnel for, for new companies that come and pitch to investors. So we get to meet them all. And we don't just meet them for you know, 15 minutes in, in a pitch meeting. We actually get to watch them on the expo floor, up on stage, you know, on the media floor. Uh, as we talked about before, we always have a lot of media attend the conference so we can even you know, see how they interact with in interview situations. And we get to know these teams really well. So before the venture studio comes on board and, and makes a small investment, we know who these people are, we know their company, and we invest in the teams. And, and our approach is very hands-on. So we, we were almost like an extension of the founding team in the sense that you know, we have a WhatsApp group with, uh, with uh, the companies and we talk to them uh, on a weekly basis, some of them almost on a daily basis, and we help them with everything we can. And now, as far as the fund is concerned, what's really unique here is that we de-risk the fund by only investing in the best companies that come out of the venture studio, right? So by the time the fund writes a bigger check, we know those teams for six months or longer. We've worked with them and we know the, the business inside out. So uh, there, there are very, very few unknowns at that point. And you know what's really cool? I think what, what you guys are doing is really innovative because you are actually using the con as you know the conferences you could actually gauge the excitement over these different companies you know from the, the participants at the conference you see who's gravitating towards what and not only that but in a lot of you know you, you know i know the conference business pretty well and and what's really unique about yours too is that you're also the money so people are coming to the conference and you're, you know, you're, you know, you're actually looking for investment opportunities at the conference as well. So that actually is a really, I, I think that's really innovative and different well, from yeah, there's, platforms. There's, we're not really in the conference business, right? So we don't try to make money off ticket sales. We try to bring the right people in the same room and, right. and make great things happen. You know, that's a lot more important to us. Yeah, the, the, the sort of joke is that we're a media company that's monetized by asset management. Um, but, right. but really, there's, there's tens of companies a day that, that send us their details on our website. But when the conference is happening, there's hundreds and thousands of companies that, that ask to speak on our stage. We get to see their pitch deck two months before the other investors who they're going to pitch to on our stage get to see. Right. So we get to ask them a bunch of questions. And then they also tell us, oh, by the time your conference comes, we're going to do X, Y, Z. And if they're good at executing and they do that, then we really want to work with them by the time the conference comes. So it's, it's, we just get this, this bit of a, a uh, peek That's behind awesome. the curtain. Uh, so uh, maybe the conference is called CIS. People have asked what oh. events are great to expose your crypto company to investors. Yes, well, uh, the rebrand is the LA yeah, Blockchain yeah. Summit. We, oh, LA yeah. Blockchain Summit. Yeah, okay. and yeah, Good. we do some really cool things to get exposure Good. into, yeah, go. Sorry. Yeah, they're giving away $100 worth of Bitcoin. Uh, That's to right. everyone yeah. who you attends this virtual conference. Com slash free, you can get $100 in Bitcoin for showing up and learning about blockchain. You might want to type that into the uh, chat yeah. so that yeah. they can see it. Um, so yeah, instead we, of most people we, have to buy tickets, you guys are actually giving away Bitcoin. That's yeah. right. Well, what what we've learned what we've learned is that you know the the greatest value from a conference is is the information that we yep. get is the people we get to meet is the the you know, we, there's, there's sort of a few sides to it. So it does feel a little bit, you know, wishy-washy, like, oh, we're getting them media. So that's going to make the company successful. It's not, it's going to amplify anybody that's already doing something great. And then what's really exciting about it is we have great partners in the space, people who aren't in our portfolio, who basically subsidize this amazing opportunity for our portfolio. We have an amazing expo floor where investors and people get to meet are uh, all of the companies that come to support us. And about half those companies happen to be our portfolio companies. The other half right. of the companies pay for the, our portfolio companies to be there. So it's, it's, it's a really uh, excellent opportunity. Otherwise, companies pay tens of thousands of dollars for, for this stuff. So um, and maybe Tim, I, I think it's a great model. And maybe you could weigh in too, just how it fits into the whole um, Draper Venture Network. Um, yeah, you know, we, so we have found that, um, Deal flow turns out to be the most valuable part mm. of a venture capital organization. And uh, 
And we have innovated on deal flow in many different ways. We have Draper University. We have the Draper startup houses around the world. We have the Draper Venture Network of venture funds around the world that all get together. Um, we keep a high profile um, and, and, that, and we become sort of our own media company. And, sorry, um, and, uh, and we do all this and so that people know, in fact, I'll send my uh, email address to everybody because uh, we find that, um, that all of those interactions, all the speaking engagements at all the conferences, all those things add up to more deal flow. And then when the deals come in, we get so many deals. Um, we have a system for filtering down to the ones that are kind of interesting. And, uh, and you have a conference and that conference is in a growing industry. You want that, and it's the leading conference in this right. industry. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, the one blockchain conference of the world. Um, and if you have a conference that generates incredible interest. Um, I know that a lot of our investments are gonna be uh, in new, new forms of blockchain software, smart contract software, build out the, the Bitcoin infrastructure, the Tezos infrastructure, the Ethereum infrastructure. Um, we, uh, you know, we're looking for companies that do this. So, uh, so tapping into the, the, the network that these guys have built and are continuing to grow uh, is a very, uh, it turns out to be mission critical for us. So we're really happy to be a part of it. And I, and I would actually probably assume too, now that the, you know, as the industry grows also, there's starting to become more competition, you know, even from the venture capital side, you know, more and more money is being, you know, allocated towards this space. So that kind of helps you guys stay, I think, you know, much more competitive because you're really you know, on the forefront of seeing all of the companies when they first come out of the gate. Um, so it's incredible. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I've always felt like if you catch the company earliest, you might make more mistakes, but, um, but you, you can generate better returns because uh, the, if it wins, it wins big and you have a big stake in it and other venture investors have to sort of act like vultures and wait for something to turn and then they pay a high price for it. Um, so I've always felt like uh, in being a fiduciary, we end up making better money by um, grabbing these things early and, uh, and, and capturing that deal flow before it becomes uh, common knowledge. I it's, think it's entrepreneurs, amazing. Yeah, I'll just throw yeah. in that. I think entrepreneurs also remember who supported them first and who was uh, who was helpful first, and uh, you know I've seen it just just from the sidelines watching Tim or or uh, funds I've been a part of in the past or uh, as a a entrepreneur now investor myself. Um, the first people I go and talk to um, uh, when I go to start something new are the people who supported me in the past, and it's very you know there's common data that proves that entrepreneurs their second and third time around are more likely to be successful. And so, um, it, you know, having that good relationship and, and, uh, and work and, and I've seen this again, I'm, I'm pointing at Tim because I, I saw this and I remember something you said at the um, Draper Venture Network Summit was, was to treat people right, even when they fail at the end. And, and be supportive of them. And you'll be the first person they call on the, nec the next time around. And having that reputation is crazy important. It's, there's, there's nothing more important than it in, in our industry. People remember what, what happened in the bad times, what happened in the good times. And, and it's you know, having that reputation as you guys do in, in really working closely with the founders, treating them right, doing right by them. I mean, when you look at that, when you look at innovators, innovators are always gonna innovate. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's always the, the next, the, the next time around, you know, it's, it's first dibs. So yeah, it's, pre it's pretty incredible. Um, so we, we, you want to take a couple of questions? I see like there's a ton of questions in the chat. Should we take some of those or should we? Yeah. 
I know. I um, think we yeah, I'm I'm answering a few just by texting, but um, a couple of them are like, oh, I, one says honestly, Colin, honestly, investors, are you or your colleagues using this COVID crisis to getting companies with a discount? I'll tell you, I'm fighting this COVID crisis. I'm hugging everybody I can. <laughs> They've, they've made a huge mistake. This is a huge policy mistake. It's a huge media blitz mistake. We have, we're afraid of each other and we shouldn't be. We need herd immunity and, uh, and it turns out it was not much of a flu. Uh, I, I'm looking and, and thinking we, we really need to get back to where we were before. And it's weird that the markets, the markets determine whether venture capitalists are paying higher or lower prices, and the public markets are sky high. I don't quite right. understand. If you're an investor today, what do you put your money into? You don't put it into China because that they that you're just handing it over to the emperor. Um, you 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 don't put it into the stock market today because it's just crazy high prices. Right. You don't Put it into bonds there you get almost no interest real estate's this really dicey thing because it, who knows if the, the governments keep this clamp on us and we have to stay six feet away and all that crap um i i look and i say well look the people who are going to take us out of this are entrepreneurs people oh, who are going to lead us to this better world they're entrepreneurs and uh everything we can do to support them Let's go for it. If the market's low, naturally we will pay a lower price. The mar market's high, we'll pay a higher price. But we're looking for those entrepreneurs that are going to re-employ those 41 million people in the U.S. that lost their jobs, and the 400 million around the world. We're going to get those fund those entrepreneurs who are redefining what schools do because clearly uh, the school system is their emperor. There has no clothes. Um, we're going to see that, and the healthcare system is also kind of, you know, it's kind of been exposed and people are able to do, do a lot more dry labs than wet labs. It's, they can, um, they can do a lot of the doctor patient thing through a zoom call. They, right. A lot of interesting things are happening out there. And this is, um, so anyway, that's a, a long answer to a short question, but um, if you're an investor, I mean, if you either support entrepreneurs or support venture capitalists who are, on, are supporting entrepreneurs, and if you want this new world, which I mean, is going to be so much more peaceful and loving and, and full of uh, vibrant and, and opulent uh, than our existing world, uh, you really... Uh, you really want to support this group because this group will uh, will be only focused on that world. Uh, you know, and hey, paper hey. teams in general are also yeah. just focused on driving this new world that's decentralized and open and transparent. It's going to be um, it's going to be better. And so, if you're yeah, sure. If you, I mean, and you probably make a lot more money. Because the, the industries we're about to transform are bigger than any industry that we've ever seen transform yep. in the history of humanity. So, you know, it seems to me like, look, you, you put your cash in Bitcoin and you put your money behind venture capital and entrepreneurship. And that's where the future is going to be. That's, we adapt and change faster than any other industry. Uh, and, you know... The fact is, too, you know, investors are going to be buying these companies one way or another, one day or another. So better to buy them now early when you could get them for a song than when they actually IPO and are trading, you know, on, on, the, on the equity markets. So it goes back to the original point of, you know, of, you know, companies, part of what's happening here, all these companies just IPOing so late in their life cycle that, that, you know, mainstream investors can't get in on the ground floor. And this is a tremendous opportunity, you know, especially at a time when we have this new and remarkable technology that really is transforming not only finance, but businesses all across the globe. 
Absolutely. I mean, uh, we we talk about getting in early and things like that. That's that's the the crux of our model, right? And um, and so we we get to. I know Tim uh, is is uh, has a call. I think I think we all uh, want to be uh, cognizant of time for everybody. And we should we end by it. hugging your know, virtual <laughs> hug. Since yeah, virtual hug. Hey, I like yeah, it. I, I want a real one. <laughs> <laughs> so so what what I do. Uh, you know, want to throw out there again to everybody. Um, we will follow up, of course, with the attendees. We'll make a video of this available and stuff. Uh, if anybody wants to connect, um, Tim put his email address, Tim at Draper VC. Mine is A at Draper Gorin Home. Joseph's is J at Draper Gorin Home. But we'll reach out. We'd love to connect with everyone and be your sounding board for any blockchain investments you want to make. It's, it's important to us to, to help uh, anybody wanting to invest in the space. And so if, if you're interested in learning more or if you're looking at a company or if a company comes to you, maybe you feel it's too early, that's, that's our sweet spot. We wanna be the first check into these companies. So, so please uh, stay, stay in touch with us. Um, uh, any, any last words, everybody else? No, thanks, thanks for, for listening, all of you. Uh, please be in touch.